Hello, everyone. Welcome to this session. We're waiting a few seconds while everyone joins and we will get started. Welcome everyone uh, to those who are joining us from different parts of the world. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are. Uh, we are very excited to have you here and we welcome you to the Land Dialogue webinar series. These dialogues are organized in partnership with the Ford Foundation, the Land Portal Foundation, the Tenure Facility, and we have special organization from Tinta, the Invisible Thread, and in this specific webinar from Waila. Thank you all so much for joining us. Uh, my name is Lina. I'm an activist and an impact and distribution strategist working with If Not Us, Then Who. This is the first land dialogue discussion for this year. And today we will be having a 60 minute session. Do not worry, we have set aside plenty of time for a QA, and a uh, but we will also be keeping a lookout for interesting questions that you may have and fit them into the discussion if that is possible. So please leave them in the Q&A of the webinar. The idea behind this series is that we can raise awareness around land rights of indigenous peoples and local communities. These rights are fundamental to achieve national, international climate goals, but also goals around governance, food security, human rights, climate mitigation, etc. There will be four land dialogues this year and each of them will cover a different topic. Now, before I tell you about today's topic, I'm gonna go into some of the guidelines for this session. So first of all, the webinar will be in multiple languages uh, since we have speakers from different regions. And so we have simultaneous translations that you can join to Spanish, French, Portuguese, and Bahasa Indonesia. If you want to access the translations, all you have to do is click on the interpretation icon, which you have in the little globe on the down part of your Zoom. Uh, then, like I said earlier, this webinar will last around 60 minutes and we have set aside some minutes for the Q&A, which you can leave in the box, not in the chat box, but in the Q&A, please. Uh, but we do want you to use the chat box to introduce yourselves, let us know who you are and what organization you come from. We also want to invite you to feel free to tweet about the sessions using the hashtag land dialogues. And you can also follow the live tweeting that we will be doing from both the Twitter accounts of Land Portal and the Tenure Facility. And finally, this session is being recorded in all the languages and we will be sharing it later. So now to get into the topic at hand, as you know, today's session is leading the way how indigenous youth combat climate change through land rights. Now, as many of you already know, young indigenous peoples and from local communities face massive challenges. Growing up in a world with climate change impeding a lot of their cultural heritage and ways of life. Now, in response, a lot of them are acting out and they are becoming new leaders in climate activism within their communities and in the world. They are championing and using land rights as one of the key measures to combat environmental degradation and to preserve their traditional lives, lifestyles. So today we'll be exploring a lot of that dynamic relationship that comes between tenure, climate resilience, and of course, we will be doing that through a lens of indigenous peoples and local community use. We have four amazing speakers today, and I will introduce them now in alphabetical order. So first, we have Aisha Salihu. She's 20 year, 25 years old, and she comes from the Mbororos Indigenous Community in Cameroon. She has a master's degree in private law and is a part of the Regional Youth Council of North Cameroon and a fellow of the ILC, as well as a civil society activist. Coming from a pastoralist background, she advocates from youth and women land rights in the north of Cameroon. And she also contributes to fighting against climate change through restoration project and agroforestry practices through the empowerment of youth and women in her community. 
Alongside Aisha, we will have Carlos Lozano Suarez. He's 24 years old and is right now the Secretary of the Youth with the Pueblos Indígenas Quichua Shasuta Amazonia, Fepiquecha. He is uh, an architect and studied environmental urbanism with a scholarship at the Universidad Científica del Sur. He was also a Phylax scholarship holder and has a diploma for capacity building and creation of sustainable projects at uh, the Universidad del Rey Juan Carlos de Madrid. We also have joining us today, Venedio Osing. Venedio was born in Banjuwangi, Indonesia. In 2020, he became a paralegal for the Indigenous Peoples Defense of the Association of the Archipelago, PPMAN, and he was active as an enumerator and contributor to the Java Region Indigenous Peoples Data Collection Program by the Ministry of Education and Culture. Him and his friends initiated the establishment of the Osing Pesinawan Indigenous School, and he's one of the facilitators there. Since 2022, he's also the Java Region Indigenous Co Education Facilitator and the Coordinator of the Youth Council for Vepan. And finally, we're going to be having Rosemary Marbella Resinos. She's originally from Macanche Flores in Petén, Guatemala. She's a 25-year-old leader and active member of the Muralla de Leon Association, a part of ACOFOP. She participated in the Mesoamerican Leadership School, which is a part of the Mesoamerican Alliance of Peoples and Forests. And she's now part of the Trainers Network. She also liaisons with the Gender Network and is part of the Board of Directors as Vice President. Now, the way this session is going to work is that I will be asking a couple of questions to our speakers to guide the conversation. Now, this is ideally a discussion, so hopefully our panelists can respond based on what each other are, are saying and build up on that answer. My only request is that our answers are kept between two and three minutes. And to the audience, once again, please use the Q&A box. So I'm going to start with our first question and uh, let's get it off with Carlos. So Carlos, based on your experiences, can you tell us what are the challenges that indigenous peoples and local community youth face within your community, within the region, in preserving cultural heritage, considering the rapidly changing world, climate change and urbanization challenges? Nina, can we just make sure that Carlos is in his um, in the Spanish channel? Hola, eh, sí, se me fue un poquito el internet recién. ¿En qué estado? Hello, estamos? yes, sir. I just uh, Gracias, lost uh, my connection for a little while. Okay, thank you, Carla. So, just asked a question. Uh, in your experience, what are the challenges that indigenous and local communities face within your community in preserving their cultural heritage within a rapidly changing world, climate change, and urbanization? Hello, all. I am Carlos Lozano, young activist. So in my context, we've been suffering uh, deculturalization, violent deculturalization. For example, we received migrants and we were forced to leave our ancestral practices, our connection with the spirits, and we were forced to leave our traditions, our way of living, we lost our culture. That is why part of our actions are focused in the activism. We need to create these spaces, which are educational spaces, in order to recover our ancestral knowledge. 
this activism is meant to teach this knowledge from generation to generation, but it, it also helps to build new spaces where the whole community can participate. Also, we see that this way of living is sustainable. For example, in our communities, we use wood, straw, uh, sand, and our traditional buildings will go back to the land. Everything is, let's say, recyclable. But the new type of building is not sustainable. So in our community, we take action in order to recover this ancestral knowledge on how to build houses. That's what I can share with you right now. Carlos, thank you very much for cha sharing those challenges with you. And now that we've heard from that situation in the Amazon basin, Aisha, I would like to hear a lot from you about what are shared and what is different with that and what's going on with your community in Cameroon. Aisha, can you hear us? Oh, yeah, I'm there. Thanks, Aisha. Can you share with us some of the challenges from your community? Okay, um, thank you, Mrs. Lina. And I'm very, very sorry for my late call. It was not uh, my fault. I was having technical issues, so it was not easy. Okay. Um, I'm called Aisha and welcome to all of all of us. I'm called Aisha from Cameroon and I'm here to share the challenges youths face in preserving their cultural heritage. One, one of the challenges uh, is cha the challenge of access to land and the securization of this land. In Cameroon, youths don't have access to land and the, the procedure is too long. It's very, very too long for them to have access to land. And for example, for the indigenous communities, the women, for them to have access to land, they have to pass through a man, which is either their brother, their husband, or their father. This is one of the challenges we face here. The second challenge is, is eviction challenge. For example, uh, we have uh, the OGEC, uh, in Kenya, the Ogie community in Kenya, they were uh, explored, uh, how will I put it? This community are forced to get out from the forest by the government, but they did not uh, like find a solution to their problem. So this, this, um, this challenge is very common, I think, in all the countries, in all the African countries, I want to say. And the other challenge we faced is the, 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 the challenge of marginalization and the access of, to decision making. We all know youths have difficulties to have access to land. And for that, they are very marginalized and are not implicated in decision taking. This equally is, um, is a challenge to youths, especially for the family. Okay. And we equally have um, financial difficulties. There is one of the challenge that is finance. Uh, youths usually have projects. They have initiatives that they want to implement, but because of lack of finance and lack of um, sustainability from the government and so on, so these youths have to let down their projects because of no finance, okay? 
um, and I think is I think for the challenges is okay for now. That was what I wanted to share with you. Thank you so, so much, Aisha. This is very enlightening. Now, I would like to pass the floor to Venerio. How about you? Are you facing similar challenges in Indonesia, Venerio? And I will give a second for our translators. Yeah. So in Indonesia, there are similarities. What we can see, the first one is the nature that already being destroyed. And the indigenous people is one of the guard or the one who responsible to maintain all the nature and environment. And in Indonesia, there are a lot of destroy activities that being conducted by companies and government. And there are companies such as mining company, palm oil plantation, or other Indonesian government program that destroy the environment such as food estate. And it caused the cultural area change a lot. And there's a lot of plants reduce the number of flow, uh, of plants and they could be gone totally gone and this creates some of the land having a polluted due to the plantation pattern that previously changed with the way that the indigenous people implemented and this caused some of the plantation period like happen like simultaneously, including the utilization of fertilizer and chemical ingredient. So the youth, we only know the name. We don't know the actual plan. And also the urbanization trend, where there are a lot of youth, at the end of the day, they have to leave their hometown. They have to go to the city to study or to work. When they leave their village, they get more knowledge, what we call like living knowledge, that basically teaching them to leave their hometown, their villages. So the indigenous people, especially the youth, they have responsibility to manage, to protect their indigenous area or cultural area. So that actually one of the issues that we are facing in terms of knowledge and the environment condition that already changes. Thank you. Thank you so much, Venerio. Uh, and actually, you have given us the floor to go with the next question. Sadly, um, one of our panelists, Marbella, is having a little bit of trouble with her connection. So for now, I'm going to go with the next question for all three of you. You were talking a little bit about how these challenges motivate the youth in your community. So, Venerio, could you share some examples of successful initiatives where young people in your communities have gained traction and worked around climate resilience, tenure systems, land rights? If you have some examples that are local to your community, that would be great. Yes, let's start with you, Carlos. We can start with you and then go to Enelio. That's perfect. I was getting a little bit mixed up with your dynamic of the different questions. Sorry, Enelio. So talking about our activities as youth activists on the land, when it comes to this deculturation or lack of uh, survival of the culture, we have taken out several activities visualizing our way of life and visualizing our culture. And uh, thank you, Aisha, for also sharing uh, those topics. But here, particularly in Peru, as indigenous people, we have different difficulties um, accessing legal ownership of territories. 
for example, and this has come to the point where m murders have ca been carried out in our communities due to land rights dispute. So we wonder what will be of us if we keep being youth activists down the line. Will all will be also be murdered as well? So we are trying to uh, push for legal recognition of land rights with NGOs, with the government, with institutions, so that we keep g going further with these topics. There's been massive progress five, six years ago. We were on the start line. And right now, we could be up until 50% success when it comes to the Quechua territories in San Martin region. So this is a success that the U has helped with because it's not just about the leadership, but also about the a success of the youth. We collaborate a lot because it is us who know how to use, for example, a smartphone that our that our elders do not know how to use. So we are the ones drafting the press releases. We are the ones intervening on radio, and we are really hoping to and working to receive this national and international support. And there's something else I wanted to highlight, and that would be the participation in international spaces. Recently, I have been participating in the international human inter-American human rights courts, in which our organization we have requested protection measures for the Santa Rosillo region in which one of the leaders was murdered due to land disputes. So we have been able to participate on those spaces. We have been able to claim justice and claim protection for us as environmental stewards. So as youth, this is something that we've been able to participate with. Thank you very much. Carlos, thank you so much for sharing that. It actually seems as though you are making very significant progress in a landscape that sadly is not favorable to land rights or to human rights of the communities. Um, and since some of the challenges you were sharing were similar, now uh, let's hear from Venerio on his thoughts about the initiatives that the youth is taking there in Indonesia. So in terms of the stories that we are doing in Indonesia since the early of 2013, the indigenous youth people under PPAN, that's one of the, uh, the alliance of Aman. So they declare about homecoming movement and there are a lot of activities and the point of the activities of the homecoming movement is to enroll and invite all the people who are living in the city to go back to their hometown, their village, to also to protect and manage their general land, so their cultural land. And some of the theme, the my friends also create like cultural school. So in in Yemen, there are 140 cultural schools. They are focusing on teaching the cultural knowledge about how to transfer the knowledge of indigenous people can be transferred to the youth or the next generation. And, and also, they also do documentation. They also do the documentation. They take note and documented all the knowledge of the customary knowledge. So in Indonesia itself, in Aman or Indigenous People Alliance of the Archipelago, in Java and Kalimantan, Sulawesi region, and also Maluku and Papua region. So every region, they, has, they have uh, differences on knowledge. So all the youth on that area, they do the activities with the same objective, but the result is different based on the situation and the land condition and their livelihood. For example, in Goa, in South Sulawesi, they documented on the medicine plan. They already 
working for quite some time. And even now, they become a referral and or reference if there are some government office to do some activities because they see that as a successful stories to protect and preserve the medicine plan. And also we have some colleague in North Sulawesi. They, they do a lot of documentation by using a video format. And one of my colleagues, he use a smartphone. They do the documentation by using the smartphone to document all the knowledge and all the livelihood. And they use the video to maximize all the documentation. So apart from doing plantation or doing food resilience through the plantation, maybe like a farming, they use their local system, such as in West Kalimantan, in district, they use the they use the Dayak people plantation where they move every season and uh, the they will have like a freeze period for the land. They will give rest to the land to recover. And also in Rompong, in Sulawesi, they do the vegetable plantation. Previously, they only uh, work, uh, they only as a consumer, but now they also the producer for the trader, for the vegetable traders, the surrounding vegetable traders. So from the consumer, they shift to con producer and so on and so forth. And there's are a lot of activities in Indonesia to restore the environment and the nature. So through the homecoming movement, this is basically inviting all the youth, everybody to manage their customary land based on their customary knowledge. And also they do mapping on customary land and they also patrol on their customary area because in Indonesia, in some area, they experience criminalization. So this customary area needs to be protected because they are facing company or the government. Thank you. Venerio, thank you so much for that very full answer. And from legal battles that Carlos was telling us about to reforesting or protecting uh, traditional knowledge through schools, passing all the way through technology and using smartphones. It seems that the innovative initiatives of the youth have a huge range. Um, so I would like to now pass it on to Aisha to hear about how that is presenting in her community and her region. Okay, thank you, Lina. The question was the initiative uh by youths, right? Okay, um, thank you, Carlos. Thank you, Venezio, and thank you, Lina. Uh, I have three initiatives of youths and women that I would like to share with you guys. Okay, the first initiative is the one implemented in Cameroon. That was a successful um, initiative that I witnessed, and it's called the Project of Agroecology by the organization called Muscuda. So this um, initiative is just like empowering the women. So the project is just for women, youths, young girls and women. So the objective is to fight against climate change and to empower the, 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 the women and the, and the females for them to be financial, uh, to be economically independent. So that is the objective. And this project, by the end of this project, 70 women were taught how to do gardening and 80 women were taught how to like uh, do production. And the project was really successful. And now it's like uh, widening itself to all the regions of Cameroon. So the second uh, project I would like to, to share here to share here is the 10 million of youth versus 10 million of land to fight against this is desertification. This project is implemented by YILA and is a successful initiative where 
20 African countries are implemented in this project. And the, the first phase is now taken on in Benin, for example. The, the objective of this project is to, um, to permit youths to have access to land, like to advocate for youths uh, land rights. Equally, like to do restoration by planting trees to fight against climate change. And equally, uh, to be uh, resilient to climate change and all the rest. Equally, like to, to help the youths to orient to, how will I put this, uh, to help the youth, to guide the youth, like to do agriculture and so as to fight against climate change and and for their this thing, and for their empowerment. The last um, project I would like to share here is the project of ADHD uh, of A AFR 100. The objective of this project is to help the local communities to like to, to plant trees to plant trees and to securize their uh, their lands so this is to like equally to empower them and to create a sort of employment to the youth on the three projects that i just uh, mentioned here they are having the same objective of empowering the youth and women and the local communities and equally to create uh, like a sustainable development to the youth and to the indigenous communities. Mm -hmm. And the basic, um, uh, the, the, the common objective of both uh, project is like fighting against climate change for a sustainable development of the countries. So that was just what I wanted to share. Thank you so much, Aisha. And you actually answered in your in your conversation here one of the questions that we had in the Q and A talking about initiatives uh, for land tenure for the youth. Uh, so that's also interesting to see in answer to what is going on here in our chat box. Now I'm going to go to the next question and ask you to please answer this one as briefly as possible since we have limited time. Considering your leadership in climate activism, I would like to know what you would like to see happen in order to build a better climate future for your generation and the next ones. Um, and in this case, I'm going to start with Aisha, since you were just sharing. What is it that you would like to see for the future? Okay, uh, I will try to be very brief. I have some three to four points to share with you regarding this, um, this question. The first thing is like uh, financial issues. We all know that youth are trying to do advocacy on land rights. So if possible, what I would like is to like the, 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 the partners, the technical and financial partners, the other organizations should try to try like to, to help financially the youth in implementing their project. This is one of the um, uh, distinct solutions. The other one is, um, basic education for me as an as a climate activist i would like um, uh, the the climate change knowledge and the restoration and all the rest should be taught in school so this is one yeah that the issue be issue it should be taught in school so that when the children will be going they will just have like yes that they have land rights and they have to protect it by doing this by doing that the other one is like to defend inclusion of youths, female youths and women, and equally um, pe people, uh, people living with disability. So for us to, for us youths like to, to go ahead in all what we are doing, we need to defend these rights, okay? The other one is um, to promote, uh, to, to promote uh, equal rights, equal human, equal rights, that is equal rights. Um, 
Yeah, that is it, to promote equal rights. And the last point is to promote uh, like good practices. We all know that the solutions come, we all know that indigenous people are the one having the solutions to their problem. That is to climate change, to, to everything, but they don't know it. So we like have to, to teach them all these type of things so that they themselves can try to, to fight against their, their problem, to try to solve their problem on their own way so that others should not come and interfere. That was what I, I wanted to share. Thank you so much, Aisha. Let's hear from Carlos now on what you would like to see for the future. Okay, I think I think we need to reduce inequalities, social inequalities. I'm okay if they just treat us as any other citizen. We shouldn't have stigma or barriers. The idea is to have less barriers in order to uh, make progresses in our projects and our actions. We don't need people to tell us to take care of the forest because the forest is it, our house, is where we live. So if we treat well the forest, if we, um, we, we take care of it as, a, as our house. In Peru, the main problem uh, against uh, the indigenous people's rights is the government. So let's start taking care Very of them. Powerful statement on the role of government in climate action. Now, how about you, Venerio? What do you think could make, uh, could be your interest in a better future? Well, for me, my response would be similar to Carlos, which is to have recognition from the government, recognition for indigenous peoples. We have thousands and even tens of thousands indigenous communities, indigenous peoples in Indonesia. The Indonesian government has to recognize us as citizens. And when there is development, indigenous peoples have the right to determine what happens in their ancestral domain so that we can ensure the sustainability and protection of our land and that future generations can know about their land, about how our land has been the same, except for what's been going on now. Our land, we should be able to protect it so that our soil is fertile so that communities can go in and out of the forest like we have done. And the youth's motivation, the youth spirit, we need to protect that. We need to maintain that to continue the indigenous people's movement. Indigenous peoples are the greatest contributors to our nature sustainability. Thank you. Thank you so much, Venerio. And actually, both you and Carlos have also answered to one of the questions that we had on the chat, which talked about how governments can support the youth in climate action. You have uh, both ma made amazing points about both uh, the need for recognition, the support, and even just letting communities do the work in themselves. Now, I wanted to give out a moment to introduce Marbella, who has been able to join us after some connectivity issues. Um, and sadly, Marbella has missed some of the conversation. So I'm just going to give her a few minutes to tell us about the challenges that the youth faces in her community and the solutions that they have to face the climate crisis. So Marbella, welcome. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. And if you can share that with us in a few minutes, then I can go with all of you to the last question. Good morning, it's a pleasure for me to be here. I think of us 
um, most important challenge is the education. We have a very low rate of education. So this lack of training, this lack of education leads to um, a lack of, uh, of jobs for us. Because if we want to be able to work, we would need to travel. And sometimes we're not able to uh, follow any training, to follow any kind of education, because you, we need uh, some economic uh, investment in order to do that. Sometimes we have to travel, to have to migrate in order to uh, find some work that leads us to the abandonment of our land. Sometimes we only see the economical benefit, we don't see the, the cultural, cultural benefit. Society only thinks about uh, building and they don't love our land as we love it. So sometimes we are forced to leave, we are forced to migrate. So what we do is taking some initiatives in order to create more jobs. We have a project about agriculture. We started with uh, a, around 17,000 quetzales, which is the currency uh, that we have in my country. And our objective as a long term is to generate more jobs in order for people not to need to leave, not to migrate to other places. It is a project which is uh, respectful with the environment, so work with the wood. In my organization, we work with uh, Ramon, which is the fruit from a tree that we have here. We use this fruit in order to create other products. We make bread, we use uh, other products from coffee beans, etc. So we use our resources in order to create uh, more jobs. So, so we that's yeah, the project so, we are so doing. Much. We're glad you could join us in the end and to get your very valuable perspective on economies and land rights and the importance of livelihoods in this conversation. Now, with very little time left, I'm going to ask you a final question before going to our Q&A. And I will ask you to please answer it in one minute or less. So the question is, what guide you into this kind of work? What keeps you there? Um, maybe talk to us a little bit about what inspires you to keep going. Uh, I will give the floor first, in this case, to Venerio to tell us about his inspirations. Well, why am I still working in this movement? Well, first, it's based on the concern about our customary land about the degrading customary land, the knowledge that we are uh, losing people who have the knowledge, our uh, uh, traditional knowledge. And the indigenous peoples in the Osing language, we say they, they are marginalized. The indigenous peoples are marginalized. They are seen as different. They're, or they're, not like, they're seen as not like other citizens. That is why I am still working in this movement. I want indigenous peoples, I want indigenous peoples to have sovereignty so that they can do what they want according to their traditions. Thank you, Venerio. What a powerful and inspiring reason, sovereignty above it all. How about you, Aisha? What is it that inspires you to keep going? Okay, thank you, Lina. I will try to be as brief as possible. 
Okay, uh, what inspires me really is the fact that I'm from a pastoralist uh, uh, community, meaning most of my grandparents and my parents never had the opportunity to go to school. And I, I had the chance to go to school to further my studies into the higher levels into university where I studied law. And while they were like uh, telling me, like they were flashbacking the stories, I heard that uh, my community out of ignorance were taking their, uh, the traditional leaders were taking their lands and using them out of ignorance because they never went to school. They don't know nothing about land right and so. So as I'm like growing up, that things really pains me a lot. That how can people just go and like taking your your uh, your lands and so because you don't have power and you don't have nothing to say. So as I obtain my uh, first level leadership, I just continue my studies. I did law, where I try now to like defend so as to defend my community and to try to protect them from those that are trying to remove their rights. Yeah, uh, sorry. Uh, are you hearing? Okay. Yeah, I was like, I did a uh, law so as to protect my community to fight for them since they cannot fight for themselves. And what really inspires me is the passion I have for protecting the environment and the community in which I work for, in which I'm from. So that is the, the short story. Thank you, Aisha, for that magical ingredient of passion you are sharing with us. What about you, Marbella? What is it that inspires you to keep going in this path? Hello again. What it drives me to continue here is uh, seeing the forest that was here before and now everything is empty. So in Guatemala we have the reserve and I and I want to fight to, for us to be able to continue breathing this uh, um, air and in order to serve this area because we should be um, led from one generation to the next one. So my idea is to work on this, to work on any project that preserves this area. I share, of course, my love for conservancy, but also spread my love for the future generations that are coming. What a powerful story of intergenerational struggle. And we will close this question with Carlos. What is it that inspires you to keep fighting, Carlos? Yes, I would like to say that I come from an indigenous peoples, uh, which ha have been traditionally have traditionally been warriors. So we get stronger after each challenge we face. So that's how we've uh, overcome our challenges. Our fathers, our mothers have been fighting against these challenges, but that's what have made us stronger. And that's what allow us to continue fighting, to be ready in order to defend ourselves. That's all. Thank you. Carlos, thank you to you and to your warrior community for all the work you do. Now, I'm very grateful to all of you for your answers. And we have a little bit of time for questions from the audience. We have been collecting them here. And I know that you already answered some of them. I'm going to bring together a couple of questions that we got in both English and Portuguese that talk about land tenure. Our audience wants to know what tools, 
uh, you use to guarantee processes of land demarcation and land rights, but also uh, how do you work around funding and investment to work on land tenure? Um, does any one of you want to begin answering? Aisha, go ahead. Okay, thanks to the audience for their kind attention and thanks to their beautiful questions. I will I will answer the first question regarding to the tools usually we use and so on. One of the tools used by, by youth is advocacy. Regarding uh, land rights, the first thing youth usually use is advocacy. By advocacy campaigns and awareness campaigns, we usually uh, try to uh, like uh, uh, attend the, uh, the the target. Yeah, that is one of the tools I wanted to share. And the other one, the other tools is like communication. Communication is a big tool if you want to like uh, in land rights. You 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 will really have to communicate and to gather real real informations and so as to like. How will I put it? Sorry. That was perfect. Thank you so much, Aisha, for those components of advocacy and communications. Does any of our other panelists uh, want to talk about their tools and funding? Go ahead, Carlos. What I can say is that our main instrument is the land rights technical committees. This is not um, pushed by the state, but at the end of the day, it is something that we are trying to bring forward with the state so that we can come into agreements with the government about the land ownership. Who is funding this? Well, in our case, is uh, funded by the uh, Peruvian government, by the PRTT3 um, project, as well as other NGOs who allow us to receive this funding as indigenous people. Thank you, Carlos. Uh, just so we have time for a little bit more of the questions of the audience, I'm going to go to the next one. Uh, but in case Benedio and Marbella want to answer as well as this one, you're welcome to do so. One of the other questions we had um, was about their being certain countries where there is not a lot of interest from the youth in taking on climate action, um, where they don't seem too concerned about this. So from your role as activist, how can this trend be reversed? How can more young people in the communities be inspired to take actions like you have? Marbella. <laughs> It is truly important to talk, but also to show by example, showing what we are doing. Not everyone is going to be a fan of every single activity, but we also need to be accepting of other people's tastes. For me, it may be interesting to take into to take forward a project such as creating uh, such as baking cookies sustainably, in which we are creating um, employment as well as being sustainable, but other youth may be interested in beekeeping or in uh, reforestation. So it's about not just focusing on a single project because not everyone is going to enjoy that particular project. We need to instead find the way to make sure that we are offering everyone a place in which they are feeling good and so that they will not uh, give Thank up the so fight. Thank you so much, Marvella, for that talk about inspiration and leading by example. Venerio, what about you? Yeah. So from me, what I can do is uh, I we can do discussion or any mechanism that can enroll the youth 
to know about their con the environment condition through the discussion, books, movies. So they will be intrigued and enrolled to protect their area, their land, and also their environment. That's why my example in Indonesia, we do documentation that basically to enroll the other youth to also intrigue and enroll to do what we are doing. Thank you. Thank you, Venerio. And thank you, Venerio. And I think we have time for one final uh, question. I'm sorry, we are, not uh, I'm sorry we are not able to answer all of them, but thankfully our panelists have talked about a broad range of topics and covered many things. Now, this last question has to do with education systems, which is something that uh, most of you have talked about. Um, somebody wants to know if the education systems that are forced or prescribed by governments affects the heritage of your communities. And what is the feeling that you have of knowledge transfer in this modern age? Um, I know, Venedio, you have been talking a lot about education, so I don't know if you want to take this question or any of our other panelists are welcome to answer. Just could you please repeat the last question? Yes, just in case it wasn't. Just in case it wasn't yeah. too clear, the question is, what is the effect that government prescribed systems have on traditional knowledge and on preservation of cultural heritage? Carlos, you can go ahead yeah. and start. The educational system is absolutely crucial to make sure that we have an intergenerational transmission of forest of knowledge. Here in Peru, we still speak our mother tongue in several communities, and this not mother tongue is absolutely crucial to maintain our knowledge. So we have been pushing for hiring Nate to hire bilingual teachers for our indigenous schools. This year, we haven't had any bilingual teachers have, that have been hired here, and we've been fighting it. But yes, we do believe this is key to keep the flame of our cultural light, teaching our mother tongue to our children. Thank you, Carlos. In one minute, Venedia, do you have some thoughts? So what we are doing is in Indonesia, the national education, they only introduce in general picture about this is, this is come from the colonization era. So that's why we want to teach the youth about their community, local community knowledge, not only the general knowledge, but there are other knowledge that they can collect and learn from the nature and the environment, such as what we are the indigenous people learning how to manage that. And when there is an issue, when there's something happen, what sign of that? Because the environment and nature can give signal of disaster about the fertility of the land and so on and so forth. So that's something that we need to teach them again. So I think I don't have, and I don't learn that from the national education system. I only can learn that from the customary study from the elderly who are living in our community. Thank you. Thank you, Venerio, and perfect use of the one minute. Thank you also to all of our speakers. Sadly, we don't have time for more questions, but the amazing news is that more land dialogues are coming, so you will have more chances in the future to connect with wonderful speakers and give your questions to them. Uh, I want to thank every one of our speakers, give them a virtual round of applause, and also thank you so much to our audience for your participation, for your comments, your notes on the chat. I want to thank our hosts, as I said in the beginning, the Ford Foundation, the Land Portal Foundation, the Tenure Facility, Waila and Tinta.
Thank you all so much. It has been a true pleasure for me to moderate this event. And to all of you, I hope you have a wonderful morning, afternoon or night, depending on where you are. Goodbye and hope to see you again soon. Thank you, Lina. Thank you to everybody and see you. Bye. Thank you.